one of the most iconic factions in all of Warhammer 40k has to be the Orcs. And today we're going to take a deep dive into the lore of the Greenskins, starting off with what is an Orc Boy? The Orc Boy is the rank and file warrior of the Greenskin race. They make up the core of any proper Orc army and are one of the most dangerous Xenos in the entire galaxy. Orc Boys are the meanest and most determined troops on any battlefield. They fall upon the victims in a great howling tide of violence and bloodshed. To a normal human, an orc boy is a monster pulled straight out of a horror story. They are hulking, brutish creatures who live only to fight. Bigger and stronger than even the most athletic human in every single way, orc boys are hell-bent on fighting. There is absolutely no reasoning with an orc boy once his sights are set on a good fight. Ugly and ill-tempered, orc boys are the dominant caste of their race. Every other orcoid fears these creatures. They see themselves as the superior beings not just to their sub-races, but any other Xeno race in the galaxy. This stems from their philosophy that might makes right, and that the value of a living thing is measured only by how tough it is in combat. Anyone or anything that stands in their way must be dominated or else destroyed. The typical orc boy stands around the height of a man, though most greenskins would be much taller if they merely stood up straight. Their frame is extremely muscular and solid, having arms so long and heavy they could kill a man with a simple swing. The knuckles of an orc boy scrape the floor as they lumber around, each one of his hands ends in talon fingers capable of tearing the enemy's throat clean out. Even the skull of an orc boy is extremely dense, able to absorb impacts that would otherwise cave in a human head. A heavy brow hides two blood-red eyes that are afire with the need to kill. Most orc boys have a constant angry look on their face. Add to that jagged fangs that jut from a heavy jaw, and you have a creature that looks more like a wild predator than a sentient spacefaring warrior. The skin of the orc boy usually tends to be some shade of green. The older and meaner the orc, the darker and more leathery the skin tends to be. Scars, scabs, and parasite litter their bodies, but the most offensive part about an orc boy is its smell. The odor of these creatures has been compared to a diseased grox languishing in its own feces. Everyone that has faced an orc invasion all say the same thing. First you smell an orc, then you hear them, and then finally you see it. When you combine their biological resiliency and their violent nature, you get orc boys that appear like they've been dragged through the streets. Aside from serious scars and open wounds, the orc boys often have reattached limbs that most of the time the skin tones don't even match. This is because when an orc boy loses an appendage, he has two options, pay for a bionic or have the pain boy attach a spare body part from a dead body. Every now and then you'll get an orc boy walking around with a foot at the end of his arm or a clawed hand for its feet. It's all part of the pain boy's learning process. Those orc boys that have enough teeth, the orc currency, will get deadly robotic replacement limbs. These can be as simple as a hooked hand or as complicated as a piston driven leg. All of these modifications are simply a testament to the durability of the orc boy. When an orc speaks, it's a low and guttural tone, thick with saliva and constant cursing. Most orcs speak in a brutal, straightforward manner, and their vocabulary is abrasive and rude. The orc boy is not something that should exist outside of combat. It is a creature built for one thing, fighting and winning. Most orc boys go to war wearing battered and grubby armor usually consists of no more than a few scraps of metal adorned with a shoulder or backplate. Some orcs force their Gretchen to paint their clan's insignia on their war gear, while others simply go into battle with rusted scraps pulled from a destroyed truck. The one thing boys place great pride in is their weapons. They prefer crude and noisy guns, and find it difficult to believe a gun can inflict any real damage unless it makes a loud and terrifying noise. The type of weapon used by an orc boy is a key defining feature. The most common orc boy is known as a slugger boy. They represent what an average imperial human thinks of when they imagine an orc. Slugger boys are brutes who love nothing more than a good fight, often leaving a horrific mess of whatever they attacked on the battlefield. They are usually armed with a ramshackled semi-automatic solid shot ballistic pistol known as a slugger, and then they carry around a brute bladed melee weapon similar to a human battle axe known as a choppa. And then there's the shooter boys. These are the orcs who prefer the shooty side of combat and serve solely as range infantry with no melee component like the standard slugger boys. A shooter boy's prized possession is its ballistic solid shot automatic rifle known as a shooter. Despite their love of range combat and firearms, shooter boys have no appreciation for marksmanship and are more addicted to the violent noise and heavy recoil of automatic gunfire. More often than not, a mob of shooter boys is deadlier when they are swinging their weapons in close combat than when actually shooting. 
And finally, we move on to my favorite, the Ard Boys. These are heavily armored standard orc infantry who fulfill the same tactical role as a basic slugger boy, but can take a great deal more punishment. Ard Boys usually spearhead orc advances as their increased durability allows them to survive heavy fire with barely a scratch. Mobs of Ard Boys retain all tactical versatility of the standard orc mobs. They can be armed with sluggas, choppas, or shootas. And the majority of these orc Ardboy mobs are veteran orcs who have managed to survive many battles and slaughtered many foes. This means they've had more of a chance to scavenge sufficient materials to build or purchase heavy armor. This means that most Ardboys are excellent scavengers even for the standards of a greenskin. Ardboys almost always are arrogant and laugh at the casualties incurred by their less well-armored comrades, who in turn call them walking magnets, but only when their comments won't be heard by the Ardboys. This lack of sympathy for their fellow greenskins is a common trait amongst the orc boys. Found throughout countless imperial reports is the brutal nature of the greenskins even amongst their own kind. Reports like orc boys stabbing each other to death only so that they can be the ones to deliver the killing blow. It almost seems like the orcs enjoy watching their comrades die in battle. Orc boys will toss scrap metal at orc vehicles in the hopes of causing a terrible accident. They reason that if left alone, vehicles would get stuck in before the rest of the foot sloggers, and they can't be having all the fun. The only thing that keeps orcs in check are the knobs, which accompany a mob of boys into battle. Without these larger and meaner looking greenskins, the rest of the orcs would fight each other instead of the enemy. When not faced with a worthy adversary, the boys devolve into a dog-eat-dog -dog mentality, and it becomes crucial for orcs to find like-minded greenskins or be marked as outcasts in their warbands. Once part of a clan, the orc boys brawl to establish a hierarchy, and these groups battle each other until a strong enough leader stops all of the infighting. Now that we know the basics of what an orc is, let's take a look at their society starting with their clans or cultures. The basic orc fighting unit is called a warband, an organization roughly equivalent to a company in human military terms. A warband is commanded by a large and aggressive orc chieftain, usually called a war boss. Warband is split into a number of mobs, with each mob usually led by an orc noble, referred to as a boss or a knob. Warbands are usually part of a tribe, but can be independent. These tribes are ruled over by a powerful warlord, the most dangerous and ambitious war boss who has fought his way to dominance over his kind. A tribe can be comprised of anything from several hundred to over a million orcs, and will claim control of an entire continent or a world. More commonly, a habitable world will sustain several orc tribes in a more or less perpetual state of war with each other, until they join in a wog. To the orcs, this state of affairs is perfectly satisfactory. If an orc tribe is beaten by another stronger tribe, the defeated orcs welcome the opportunity to be led into battle by a new warlord of even greater power. Tribes are constantly breaking apart and reforming in the crucible of battle, but at the core of orc society is something called a clan. Orc clans cut across warbands and tribal boundaries. The clans embody a philosophy among most orcs, each clan emphasizing particular elements of the orc culture above all others. Some orcs become obsessed with their clan ideals, so much so that they seek out like-minded individuals and join with them to create a warband which completely exemplifies the purest trait of their clan. However, most tribes are less dominated by their clan ideals, and clan values merely serve to install a sense of unity and to make a common enemy of tribes which are part of other clans. A large tribe usually contains many different clans, and each clan has its own distinct character and identity. There are seven major clans that have spread from one side of the galaxy to the other. These are the Goths, the Snake Bites, the Bad Moons, the Blood Axes, the Death Skulls, the Evil Sons, and the Freebooters. The orcs that belong to the Goths clan are the biggest, meanest, and most brutish of their kind, and that's saying something for a greenskin. Of all of the clans, the Goths are the most inspired by the thrill and thunder of battle. Goths will take any excuse to start a brawl, even amongst themselves. As a result, the Goths are specialists in hand-to-hand -hand combat, and they prefer their battles up close and personal. Goth armies are notorious for the sheer number of orc infantry they muster in times of war. A Goth mob is usually at least 20 strong, and a true Goth horde has hundreds of times that number at its heart. When the Goths go to war, the ground shakes to the thump of thousands of steel-capped boots. The Goths use the bull's head as their clan emblem as they feel a kinship to the bad-tempered and violent beasts. They dress predominantly in black, and see the gaudy colors sported by other clans as inappropriate for a serious orc warrior. Though they sometimes decorate their war gear with checkers and dags, camouflage is all but unheard of, being viewed as cowardly in the extreme by the older, more traditional goths. 
After all, what self-respecting orc would want to do himself out of a good fight by hiding himself from the enemy like a sniveling grot? The orcs that belong to the Evil Sons clan are irresistibly attracted towards fast vehicles and loud noises. They have an unquenchable need to careen around the battlefield at great speeds, plowing into the ranks of the enemy before racing off to cause more carnage elsewhere. Though an Evil Sons army will include foot troops, these infantry mobs will usually save up their teeth for when they can afford a vehicle of their own. The Evil Sons never stay in one place for long and are always on the lookout for new victims and settlements to slaughter. The armies of the Imperium find it extremely difficult to engage the Evil Sons on anything other than the Orc's terms, for the clan's supercharged trucks, battle wagons, and buggies can outmaneuver the heavy vehicles of the Imperium with ease. The emblem of the Evil Sons clan is a blood-red Orc face, grimacing from the heart of a sunburst. They wear red clothes and often paint their machines red too, firmly believing in the old Orc adage that red goes faster. Evil Sun war bosses will usually have their vehicles painted red, from the grill to the exhaust. The habit of painting the vehicles red has its roots in the ritual covering of the orc's mounts with the blood of the foe, a practice that is still observed by some of the older Evil Sun tribes. The orcs of the Bad Moon's clan are the richest of the orc clans. This is because their teeth grow faster than anyone else's, meaning that even the lowliest Bad Moon has a steady supply of wealth. This is not regarded as an unfair advantage, as any orc big and nasty enough can simply smash the teeth out of a Bad Moon's head. The Bad Moons fulfill the role of a merchant class in the Orc society and have a reputation for showing off. The vehicles used by the Bad Moons are always covered with decorations. A mob of Bad Moon knobs on foot will bristle with personalized combi weapons and gold-plated death guns, sauntering into battle with enough firepower to slaughter a whole platoon of the enemy. These heavily armored Orcs think it's funny to cut down an enemy unit just as a rival Orc clan is about to engage them in melee. Bad Moons love gold more than any other metal and will commonly sport a couple of glinting teeth in their grins. They favor golden yellow and black for their war gear, taking a snarling moon on a field of flames as their clan emblem. Their armor and war gear is painted with gaudy patterns in the clan's colors, and will have more jewelry and piercings than any other clan. However, only a fool underestimates the raw strength of the orc beneath the ostentation. The orcs of the Snake Bites clan are considered backwards by most technologically minded tribes, for they still follow the old ways. As a result of this rugged lifestyle, snake bites are usually weathered, beaten, and as tough as an old boot. They are experts in the field of breeding stock, and their grots and squigs are the fiercest in all of orcdom. The snake bite clan's name and emblem come from the rite of passage that involves the young orc aspirant coating an extremely poisonous serpent into biting him and then sucking out the venom to prove his toughness. Snake bites hence build up a resilience to natural poisons and keep snakes as pets. They always carry a selection of venomous beasts with them when they migrate to a new planet, in case the local serpents prove disappointing. Snake bite run herders breed large numbers of Gretchens, who come in very handy when feeding the large creatures in the infamously pungent snake bite menageries. In times of war, the Grots are given crude weapons and herded into battle, often manning batteries of guns and accompanying vengeful weird boys. When the snake bites launch an assault, it is with shocking ferociousness as the enemy is buried under an avalanche of battle-crazed orcs, snapping squigs, and stabbing Gretchen. The orcs of the Blood Axe clan are held by other clans to be a bunch of untrustworthy gids. They trade openly with the Imperium, parlaying with the foe, and will even consider retreating from battle if faced with insurmountable odds. Perhaps once intended to make the Blood Axe's natural leaders, these qualities have instead earned them a reputation as treacherous scumbags. In fact, most of the Blood Axe's reputation is undeserved. True, they have made most contact with the forces of the Imperium, occasionally fighting as mercenaries and making extensive use of Imperial War materials. But then every orc had seen the funny side of extorting weapons from a human planet, only to use them against their former owners. Blood Axes view the act of getting shot down before they have killed any of their enemy as a terrible waste of an opportunity, and so adopt the practice of wearing camouflage. This makes them a target for other orc clans, but in truth the Blood Axes care little. The war bosses of the Blood Axe clan seem to have a better understanding of the grand strategy of war, planning out large-scale battles or even entire campaigns in detail. When dealing with other races, the Blood Axes are uncompromising and vicious. Should a human ever be caught trying to swindle a blood axe, he will be hacked to death where he stands. The orcs of the Deskall clan are plunderers without equal. They are tremendously good at looting, borrowing, scourging, scavenging, and stealing things from their fellow orcs, and notoriously bad at giving them back. 
death skulls would make capable scientists and excellent engineers if their fascination for new things lasted longer than the time it took to steal them. The death skulls see battle as a two-stage process, often hurrying the killing part in an effort to speed along the scavenging spree that follows. After the battle, the boys really go to work, feverishly stripping the corpses of the fallen of everything from ammunition to bootlaces. Many death skulls will take grisly trophies such as the victim's scalp or skull into the bargain. Only when the loot is returned to the camp does the inevitable infighting break out as the death skulls trade, barter, and auction off their ill-gotten gains. Death skulls use the horned death head as their emblem. Once they have stolen something, they personalize it to establish ownership once and for all. This often involves painting it blue, the color which they believe attracts the eye of the gods and protects them from harm. The superstitious death skulls even use blue war paint, sometimes going so far as to paint themselves blue from head to toe the night before the battle. And then there are the orcs of the Freebooter clan. In all reality, they're not a clan. They are piratical orcs who exist on the fringe of our culture. Freebooters are bandits and sellswords belonging to no specific tribe. Often they will employ what the Imperium has named the Jolly Orc Skull and Crossbone Emblem, a universal symbol of all freebooters. These mercenary orcs are known to use the sigil to adorn their banners, clothes, and vehicles. Freebooters are known as outcast orcs who roam the universe in small, often dilapidated orc spacecraft and hide out in isolated planets and large asteroids. The band is usually led by hardened war bosses who prefer the title of captain. These individuals are the biggest, strongest, and most cunning cutthroat orcs within their mercenary war bands. Luckily for those spacefaring races, the presence and predations of many orc freebooter fleets are without unified purpose and they often are more inclined to war upon their own kind as much as anything else. Now that we understand the basics of the orc clans and their society, let's take a look at what makes them so numerous within the galaxy. It all comes down to their reproduction. If reproduction is the only true purpose in life, then the orcs have mastered the purest sense of the meaning of life. From a single orcoid, hundreds of spores will fly into the wind, and like dandelions of death and destruction, they will come to rest on a surface and develop into one of the many orcoid subspecies. This of course makes the orcs asexual, meaning that there doesn't have to be any sort of fusion between organisms. A single orc can populate an entire planet in a matter of solar years. Now that brings me to a valid but very goofy question that we get a lot. Does an orc have sexual organs? And the answer is simple. You just have to ask your mom. She'll know. Orcs do not have sexual organs. They are what is called homothallic, meaning that everything they need to reproduce is already inside of the orc, and they don't need another orc to fertilize their spores. And since there's no need to attract or inseminate a mate, then the orc doesn't need a sexual organ because he is the sexual organ. So whenever you're losing against an orc player, you are figuratively getting fucked. The orc reproductive biology has a lot of perks that were intentionally engineered into their genes by the old ones and that are often overlooked by the single-minded greenskins. Besides allowing the orcs to focus only on waging war, the amount of orc spores produced are so many that the species never has to worry about protecting their spores. They never have to worry about completely being exterminated. The surrounding area around an orc encampment is filled with orcoid subspecies like squigs, grots, and snotlings, which grow from the spores carried out of the encampment through environmental means. Some far-flung spores can even land inside an area never touched by any of the main orc mob. These orcs mature away from the tribe, and they will soon either join the rest of the lads or become feral orc boys. Now for the most part, the orcs don't really care about their spores, but there is one odd boy called a runt herder that actually cultivates the spores in order to breed aggressive squigs and squigots. But the true process of how they do this is completely unknown. It must be some type of biological intelligence, just like the mechs or the weird boys. As far as what other races in the galaxy have been able to gather, there is an underlying process that dictates what type of orcoid will mature from a spore. For example, if spores come to rest on a patch of land that is completely free of orcs, the first orcoid to be produced is a squig. These squigs fight one another, releasing more spores that produce into the next orcoid subspecies known as a snotling. The snotlings are either eaten by the squigs or they themselves eat the squigs, and then when the population of snotling and squigs reaches a certain level, then the Gretchen are produced. And then finally, at the end of the cycle, the orc boys are created. 
It seems like this process is hierarchical, so the squigs consume the native resources, the snotlings consume the squigs, the Gretchen then organize the snotlings or bully them around, and then finally the orc boys are at the top of the food chain and control all other subspecies. It's actually rare to find a case where the higher tier subspecies outnumbers a lower tier. There are always enough servants and food in a proper orc encampment for the top tier. This is another one of the amazing features engineered into the orc biology. It guaranteed that the orcs at the very top always had food and resources. And the best part about this whole process is that it only takes a couple of days for all of these species to mature, which is why orcs are so difficult to get rid of once they're on a planet. Now to understand more of the creation of the orcs, I'm going to link an orc origin story up above. It not only talks about the old ones, but all of the different biological processes that were developed into the orc body for the old ones uh, war in heaven. So check that out if you're interested. But finally, let's answer a follow-up question to all of this information. And that is, why do orcs wear clothes if they don't have sexual organs? And it's not because of shame like a lot of you guys have suggested, it's actually because orcs are vain, and donning clothes shows off the orc status in their tribe. This has been a social norm developed both by interacting with other intelligent species and a natural thing that happens within the orcs. For example, bad moon orcs naturally want to show off their wealth, so they wear certain things. The best example is also the Blood Axe Gang. They wear military uniforms that are a mockery of the Imperial uniform. It's a way for the orcs to basically show that they are better than the other race. Now, feral orcs, on the other hand, are often naked. Feral orcs are the ones that just grow out in the wild. Any clothing that is worn is either a show of pride, they usually kill something and now they're wearing the body as a trophy, or it's a form of protection, so like scales or chitinous armor that was hard to pierce, so now they use that as their armor. One of the best things about the current orc lore is the introduction of the Beast Naga Boys. While most people call them Primaris Orcs because they see them as a way for GW to force existing orc players to buy a whole new army, effectively making their old orc boy models undesirable, which by the way is probably the true intention, once we get over the standard GW hate, you realize that the Beast Naga Boys highlight a piece of orc lore that was kind of ignored in previous editions. It points out the diversity of the greenskin race. These specialized and unique orcs are just one of a numberless amount of greenskins that exist scattered throughout the universe. The lore calls these variant orcs odd boys, and we know a lot about a very few, like the weird boy, the mech boy, the runt herd, freebooter, and so on. But these are just the most common type of odd boys seen within a greenskin tribe. Small patches of strange and unusual orcs exist all over. And the Beast Naga Boys is just a reminder of how these odd boys possess the ability to increase in number to the point where they become their own orc tribe. The first thing I want to do is explain how these odd boys are created. To do that, I have to talk about the orc biology. You see, the Greenskins were created by an ancient race known as the Old Ones in order to fight their greatest enemy, the Necrons. The full details about the war in heaven can be found in this video about the Quark, sometimes referred to as the Brain Boys. But in order to make the orcs a formidable warrior race, the Old Ones had to biologically hardwire all of the technical knowledge that a warring species would need in order to succeed in war. From how to build a warp drive, to creating successful supply chains, everything is innately known by specific orcs within the tribe. But it's through this genetic engineering how a standard odd boy like a pain boy is born with a natural understanding of how to operate on other orcs. Now sometimes these deep-rooted dispositions go overboard, and orcs become obsessed with a particular set of interests. So in the example of the pain boy, an orc medic that is absorbed by the need to manipulate the orc biology becomes a subset of a pain boy known as a mad dog which operates on everything it can get its hands on. And down the rabbit hole you go where you have a subset of a subset of a particular odd boy. It is in this interesting realm of dysfunctional orc biology that you have the ability to homebrew your own style of odd boy. And the best way to create your own is by going over some of the odd boys within the already established orc lore. Let's start with one of my favorites that, like the Beast Naga Boys, is an offshoot of a feral orc, or a primitive-minded orc. They are known as Mad Boys. These are feral orcs that develop extreme psychosis after being reintroduced to advanced forms of technology. 
sometimes referred to as nutters by the other greenskins, the brain of a mad boy goes into a complete shock from the amount of death and destruction that can be created through the use of technologically advanced weapons. They turn into raving lunatics, laughing and arguing with themselves as they aimlessly walk about an orc encampment. They'll often get into fights with other greenskins over nonsense, like whether or not a particular tree looks like Gork or Mork. Sometimes they think that the death of a specific Gretchen will stop the voices in their head. As a result of this psychosis, however, even other orcs will be careful to keep their distance from a mad boy, because they really never know what they're going to do. This unpredictability extends to the battlefield. Nutters can prove to be savage fighters, ripping apart the enemy with the same fury as a death company marine, or they can suddenly be overwhelmed by their own insanity and start attacking their fellow greenskins. The only reason these odd boys are somewhat tolerated by knobs and war bosses is because they know the true value of a mob of mad boys. Known as mad mobs, this collection of paranoids, mantics, and schizos are guided by weird boys, or war pets. Together, these lunatics are often separated from the other orcs and placed into small shanty towns connected to the main greenskin encampment. An orc war boss with a mad mob at their disposal is considered very lucky because of the sheer power that can be unleashed. If the war band goes to war, the presence of these lunatics on the battlefield is seen as a blessing from Gork and Mork. Now, in the excitement of battle, these mad mobs are unpredictable. The mania of one mad boy can suddenly spread to others, leading to an outburst of collective madness. When this subsides, it will be replaced by an equally erratic and unpredictable series of actions stirred up by the ravings of another mad boy in the mob. And so it goes on throughout the battle. The mob rampages around the battlefield, causing untold amounts of worry to friend and foe alike, each action as bizarre as the next. Not even the greatest tacticians in the galaxy could create a plan to eradicate this type of chaos. The best part of these mad mobs is when the mad boys do something amazingly appropriate at exactly the right moment, causing all sorts of trouble for the enemy and saving some poor beleaguered orc mob in the nick of time. The funniest part about these mad mobs are the terrible inconveniences created during battle, like when they decide to hold impromptu shouting contests in the middle of a night raid or pelt the foe with the volley of stick bomb pins but holding onto the bomb itself. Now, Mad Boys are an example of one of the most savage types of greenskin odd boys, but not all of these orc variants lean towards the destructive side of things. One of the least talked about but probably most important odd boys for the entire race as a whole is the Sum Boys. These are orcs born with a Scrooge McDuck level of hunger for wealth. To get deeper into this lore, let's talk about the basics of orc economy. The species-wide currency within the orc culture is known as teeth, and it's literally orc teeth. They use their big sharp fangs like we would use coins or paper notes. They've been using this natural form of currency since any of them care to remember, and it was more than likely hardwired into the orcs collective psyche by their creators the old ones because of how perfect it works with their biology. Orcs go through teeth in a similar manner to sharks, shedding and replacing them every few Terran years, and unlike human teeth, orc teeth degrade over time. Because of this, the number of teeth in circulation never diminishes enough to create a dramatic shortage, and no individual orc can be reduced to poverty for too long. If an orc falls on dire times, he can simply ask a pain boy to extract a couple of teeth prematurely to pay for the appropriate weapons he needs to go knock out some teeth for himself. Teeth are used to purchase anything from squig pies to battle wagons. The more teeth a single orc can gather, the more access he has to deadly weapons and war gear. Now, because teeth disintegrate over time, the concept of saving has little meaning in the greenskin society. But that's where the odd boy known as the sum boy comes into play. These orcs are cunning enough to understand that it's better to lend out their teeth rather than using them themselves. By letting other orcs borrow teeth, they get rid of the risk of decay and they gain loot or favors from other orcs. To protect themselves from thieves and raiders, they establish fortresses that act as hidden safe houses for their loot, and they either pay for bodyguards or form small war bands by promising boys a proper fight when they go off collecting their debt. These some boys start off as simple loan sharks, but if they're tough enough to protect their investments, they can become successful bankers and form bonds with other some boys across entire sectors and then lend teeth to freebooter captains, war bosses, and big mechs. In this way, the most successful sum boys, sometimes referred to as sum bosses, become the benefactors of dozens of wogs across the galaxy. Almost every major orc empire has at its core this powerful group of sum boys that act as a centralized bank for the orc-controlled territories. 
Without these odd boys, orc empires wouldn't exist and wogs would lack the resources to rage across multiple sectors. Another less known group of odd boys that provides a sense of chaotic unity amongst the orcs are known as the Yellers. They are called Yellers because they travel around orc encampments, literally screaming and hollering about the orc gods Gork and Mork. It is these insane preachers that stir up the greenskin mobs with tales of the glorious brutality and cunning of their orc gods. Like most other aspects of orc society, eventually some big hulking greenskin will get tired of the ravings of these lunatics and attempt to force the yeller to shut up. If the yeller can hold his ground and defend himself from the assault, he will gain the respect, but most importantly the fear of other orcs. This will increase his following and validate his word to the greenskins that naturally follow the loudest and meanest orc. What was once a small gathering of orcs then turns into a full-on rally with the yeller at the center of it all. This makes the role of the yellers similar to a religious priest or bishop, spreading and reinforcing the belief of Gork and Mork. But unlike normal priests, yellers aren't interested in understanding or spreading the theological complexities of their religion. They are simply there to stoke the primitive and narcissistic urges of the greenskins. At the core of these sermons is the construction of the greenskin identity. Orcs are the toughest and meanest race in the entire galaxy because Gork and Mork are the strongest gods. And both gods are stronger than any other god because the orc race is the best. And this core message is recycled throughout every aspect of their preaching. These rallies then solidify a collective pride in their own race the expense of everything else of course, a lot of hate towards other races like Umis and Tinheads, and a lot of mocking of the Emperor and other gods. The inexperienced yellers might lean on one of the orc gods more so than the other, claiming that Gork is more cunning than Mork, which will then create infighting within their congregation, but a proper yeller, a well-trained yeller, will direct the hate only towards other races. And this ability to stir up entire tribes is a powerful tool that gets the attention of war bosses and big mechs. That's why yellers are sometimes rewarded for captivating their audience right before a battle. Sometimes this reward might be teeth, other times it might just be a break from the beating that a war boss gives. Either way, having a yeller in an orc encampment is crucial for directing the greenskin brutality. Now there's tons of other odd boys that we've created videos for, the mech boy, the weird boy, all that kind of stuff. But one thing I want to do now is take a step back and look at a green skin that gets overlooked most of the time, the Gretchen. Found within every type of orc warband are mobs of terrifying and diminutive green skins called Gretchen. These tiny green skins are made to fight tooth and claw for their pitiful lives. And when forced to fight or die, a sizable mob of Grots can overrun a well-prepared foe clawing and biting frantically in desperation to stay alive. Though not especially dangerous up close, the average Gretchen is more than capable of outshooting his orc masters. This talent goes largely to waste of course as no self-respecting orc is going to give a decent shooter to these Gretchen. However, the mass volleys with the so-called Grot Blasters can cause a surprising amount of bloodshed. And not only are Gretchen needed on the battlefield, but when orcs are not waging war, it is the Gretchen who is in charge of the day-to-day -day activities of their orc masters, like raising squigs for food and sport, cleaning up after brutal and bloody brawls, and just about anything else that the orcs don't want to do for themselves. Although known to the Imperium as Gretchen, most orcs call them Grots, as they don't care to differentiate between the Gretchen and the Snotlings. Although they possess a similar physiology to their larger brethren, they are not as strong or as tough. To compensate for this, the Gretchen possess an abundance of low cunning. They scurry around the larger greenskins on scrawny legs, their grasping fingers over snatching and covertly stealing from the unwary. Gretchens have large bulbous heads and wide tattered ears that flatten against their bald plates when they're afraid, which is almost all the time. Sharp fangs fill their jaws, ever ready to be sunk into the flesh of the weak and the infirm, and malice gleams in their eyes whenever there is an opportunity for violence. The Gretchen's large nose gives them an excellent sense of smell. Their ears afford them a similar advanced sense of hearing, and their eyesight is acute even in the dark. These traits, combined with an innate talent for self-preservation, mean that the Gretchen can not only survive, but thrive in a society dominated by vicious predators. Some Gretchen have their survival instincts honed to such a degree that they possess a rudimentary sixth sense. It improves their chances of survival by exhibiting fawning behavior to their orc masters. Though brave, Gretchen will pull face and make rude gestures behind the backs of a bigger greenskin if you are stupid enough to risk doing so openly. Gretchen are faster, leaner, and quick to spot an opportunity, meaning that many wind up as assistants or servants to more important orcs like mech boys or knobs. Others simply attempt to stay out of the orcs way, 
Whole groups of Grotz fashion hideouts amidst the scrap piles and tunnels too constricted for orcs to squeeze their bulk down. When the time comes to go to war, the Gretchen are flushed out of these hideouts in mass by squig hounds of the Runt Herders or a few enthusiastic Burna boys. As the downtrodden underclass of Greenskin society, Gretchen get herded into battle whether they want to or not. Though far from natural warriors, they are at least passable shots and can prove surprisingly dangerous in large numbers. Coupled with their vicious streak, this makes Gretchen mobs more of an asset than they may first appear. Gretchen mobs make up for their shocking lack of quality with sheer quantity. The natural cowardice and feeble-limbed incompetence of the Gretchen subspecies does not predispose them to the art of war, and a typical Grot would prefer to have his head buried in a spore hole than actually participate in a proper battle. There do exist Gretchens with a little more backbone, and when emboldened by the possession of their own guns, these diminutive greenskins can be enlisted with a promise of plunder, or when that fails, threats of beatings. The short-range nature of the ramshackled weapons typically afforded to the Gretchen mobs encourage them to get into the thick of fighting quicker. They have rusted pistols, simple knives, and occasionally a blunderbuss. Gretchen are actually pretty good marksmen, and when the orcs allow them to have better firearms, they might even possess a credible threat to the enemy. The sad reality, however, is that the Gretchen mobs rarely win any glory on the battlefield, as they are used by the orcs as a combination of cannon fodder, bullet shields, mine clearance devices, and living carpets. A mob of Gretchen is generally several dozen strong, the Grotz bickering and shrieking as they scamper towards the foe. Some are savvy enough to recognize that there is no point in trying to defy their orc masters, acknowledging that their best chance of survival lies in showing willingness. These Grotz are at least allowed to pick and choose where and who to fight on the battlefield. As for the rest of their kind, their reluctance to see frontline action is usually remedied by a swift boot to the head from the nearest runt herder. Runt herders are tough and leathery old odd boys with a strange predisposition towards the control and well-being of their tribe's grots. Far from seeing this as a chore, they relish in their work, for theirs is an ancient and well-respected orc profession with the added perk that a snack is not too far away, which means runt herders eat ass. Gretchen ass. <coughs> runt herders often cement their natural control over the lesser greenskins with a large spike claw on a pole. Affectionately known as a grab-a-stick, the runt herder can catch a fleeing grot and hurl the offending runt into a nearby minefield with one fluid motion. Low-key, they straight up sound like a Gretchen's pimp. Many runt herders will have their local mech boys carry out a snazzy upgrade to their stick, modifying it into a crackling grot prod that can be used to deliver a nasty jolt to a squig, a runt, or anything else in reach. Needless to say, these odd boys delight in the sight of enemy warriors doubled over in convulsion as high-voltage currents run through their bodies. Only once the foe is down for the count do the runt herders release their voracious squig hounds to finish the job. The most common type of Gretchen is called a mob Gretchen. These are the ones that are either too stupid, too brave, or too unlucky to find a safer place in an orc tribe. They are pressed onto the front lines by a runt herder, their life expectancy is very small, and are either used as living shields by the orcs, as living mine detectors, or as cannon fodder. The next tier up of Gretchen are those grots that got favored by some orc knob and are now filling roles that are a little specialized for that individual orc master, such as the ammo rut, where the Gretchen's role is to make sure that his orc master never runs out of ammunition or at least not too fast to enjoy the fighting. Then there's the messenger Gretchen known as a sty boy. These climb on their master's shoulder and wave flags of orcish glyphs to relay information from one orc warband to the next. This long range communication system might seem crude, but it allows a measure of coordination between an orc mob when they are out of shouting range. Then you have the more specialized Gretchen like the orderlies that assist the orc pain boys who carry out surgery during the battles and is always there to hold up limbs or bandage up and stitch up dying orcs. And then there's the Repair Gretchen, who serves an Orc Mech Boy, and he usually either embarks on one of the many vehicles to keep an eye on its systems and perform basic emergency repairs, or gathers around the Orcish Master to provide some type of assistance. The luckiest Gretchen, in my opinion, is the Gun Crew Gretchen. They operate the Orcish artillery pieces, whether they're on static emplacements or they're part of a vehicle. The only problem with being a Gun Gretchen is that the guns themselves are extremely unreliable, and the mortality rate of the Gun Crew is still pretty high. There are also some lucky Gretchen that are singled out by their mechboy masters to get hardwired into a Killicon combat walker. Most Gretchens are all too eager to get a chance to pilot these war engines, and after the implantation, they usually celebrate by stomping whoever had previously bullied them into a fine paste. However, even with the increased firepower, Killicon pilots are still cowards at heart, and some cons have been known to run off the battlefield at the first sign of danger. The No Deep Dive video could be complete without exploring the lore of the greatest orc to have ever lived, Godsgul Magorok Thraka. 
Godskull started his career as a common goth warrior on the backwater planet of Urk. There was really nothing special about this orc. That was until a raid upon a space marine command sanctum, where Godskull caught a bolter shell to the face that pummeled a large area of his cranium and caused extensive brain damage. Luckily, the death skull pain boy known as Mad Doc Grosnik was close at hand and he replaced part of Godskull's cerebrum with bionics made from adamantine. This experimental augmentation had two distinct side effects besides preventing his death. Firstly, it afforded even greater protection to what was left of his brain, and secondly, and probably most crucial for the wider galaxy, Grotznik's surgery also triggered something deep within Godskull's mind, a mantic new glint that entered his blood-red eyes. Fresh drive and ambition invigorated his formerly unremarkable existence. Godskull claimed to be receiving visions sent by Gork and Mork themselves, visions that urged him on to power and conquest. From that day forward, Godskull's rise to power was meteoric. Those orcs of Urk who didn't fall in line were rapidly bludgeoned into submission. Godskull had brawn and belligerence enough to establish his dominance over the entire world. Few of his subjects gave much thought to whether or not the new warlord was really talking to the gods or was simply a delusional megalomaniac. And when the planet star began to flicker and perish, Godskull hailed this as a sign from Gork and Mork that it was time for the Wog to depart the world and stomp the galaxy flat. Now by some dark quirk of fortune, Godskull and his horde were able to capture and board the Space Hulk world killer in this moment of great need. The mech boys quickly got to work and they set off across the stars. Bursting into real space after a long span of time spent in the warp, Wa Godskull emerged into the rich and prosperous Imperial system. They wasted no time in falling upon its capital world of Armageddon, a world that would make Godskull's name. The fortress world of Armageddon was a rich hub of commerce, military industry, and transportation that lay upon a key warp route towards the Segmentum Solar. It was well resourced and heavily defended by naval assets, regiment upon regiment of Astra Militarum, and a mighty complement of the Iron Squall Titan Legion. And for all of this, Armageddon wasn't ready for Godskull. Not only did the visionary warlord have immense numbers and overwhelming momentum on his side, but Armageddon's planetary governor, Hervin von Straub, was also a disastrously incompetent egomaniac. Straub's piecemeal attempt to deal with what he sneerly viewed as the orc irritant, while keeping up appearances with the wider Imperium, played right into Godskull's jagged claws. Wag Godskull rampaged across the continent of Armageddon Prime, crushing each regiment of planetary defenders and cannibalizing their wrecked tanks. As one bastion after another fell, still Straub did nothing. Instead, his duty was taken up by the Imperial Commissar Yarek, this act of disobedience for which he was exiled to the remote Hive Hades. Meanwhile, Gatsko's hordes crossed the green hell of Armageddon's equatorial jungles, where Straub had claimed that they would not tread. Having reached the continent of Armageddon Segundus, they crushed the Iron Skull Titans and left their graffiti-scrawled wreckages to burn. The Warlord himself led the storming of Hive Infernus just as the season of storms descended. He even let loose wild war bands of speed freaks into the ash wastes to run down refugees and retreating Imperial military assets as they tried to reach the safety of Hive cities further south. In desperation, Straub unleashed his ancient stockpile of virus bombs, but amidst the tightly packed battlefields of Armageddon Segundus, human casualties from these indiscriminate weapons were as severe as those suffered by the orcs. All the while, Godskull drove his wog onward, with unbreakable determination, eventually crushing Hive Hell's Reach despite the suicidal courage of the city's defenders. Then came the siege of Hive Hades, and with it, a sudden change in the fortunes of war. Under the leadership of the exiled Commissar Yarek, Hive Hades' defenders fought as if possessed. So spectacular was the battle, so slow the orc advanced, that Godskull came to lead the siege in person. Showing cunning far in excess of an average Goth warlord, Godskull employed all his tactics and stratagems he could dream of, but Yarek countered each one. Orcs fought volunteer defense militia along every processional, every barricade, and even through the Hive City's many ducks and crawlways. In Yarek, Godskull had met an enemy worth the fight. The Grand Warlord swiftly became obsessed with defeating this tenacious and respected foe. However, this obsession is both the strength and weakness of most orcs. The same tendencies that make them relentless foes, reckless pilots, and prolific inventors also leads them to ruin, which is what happened to Godskull at Hive Hades. The meat grinder around the besieged hive sucked in ever more orc material and warriors, leaving those warbands assailing Hive Tartarus and Hive Acheron ill-determined and short of reinforcement. 
And when Imperial support finally showed up in the form of the Ultramarine Salamanders and the Blood Angel Space Marines, the secondary Orc hordes could not hold. But even as beset as the Greenskins were by the freshly arrived Adeptus Astartes, Godskull didn't give up. He again proved his superiority to most Greenskins by recognizing the damage that his obsession was causing and setting a plan in motion to readdress the balance. Sadly, he faced the unified strategic brilliance of the Blood Angels commander Dante and his allied Space Marine commanders, coupled with Yarick's hideously costly defenses of the Ruin Hive Hades, and Godskull's wog was at last broken. Nearly every Orc warlord in history has gone down fighting alongside their warband, not Godskull. He fled Armageddon, leaving the world infested with scattered greenskins and vowing to one day return. After all, Armageddon had put up the best fight Godskull had ever experienced. He wasn't about to pass up a chance to enjoy it all over again. 57 years to the day after his defeat on Armageddon, Godskull returned at the head of a still more enormous walk. The planet's defenders had spent decades rebuilding and fortifying against the coming of the Grand Warlord. They now named him the Beast of Armageddon. Yet Godskull had also not been idle. He had spent years fighting one brutal conflict after another, both to subjugate rival warbands and also to test and perfect strange new weapon technologies against which his enemies could not hope to be prepared for. Many and exhaustive are the accounts of the conflicts that followed. Godskull brought a war that his enemies and even a number of his own underlings were utterly wrong-footed by. The Grand Warlord had mercenary freebooter strike at Agriworlds and shipping around Armageddon, both to choke off supply routes and to spread terror as he approached. He hit the system with multiple roughly coordinated orc fleets to better encircle and destroy Imperial naval defenses. Rather than get drawn into another fight for Hive Hades, Godskull had his Space Hulk deploy tractor beams, using them to ensnare asteroids before releasing them onto the Hive from low orbit. He unleashed drop fortresses known as rocks, built scrap iron submersibles to cross the planet's storm-lashed oceans, and directed super teleporters to beam towering war effigies directly into battle. And for all of this, the Imperium hurled tides of reinforcements. The battle for Armageddon became an endless grinding war of attrition despite all of Godskull's best efforts. As the conflict ground ever on, so did the Grand Warlord suffer increasingly painful and garish visions sent by Gork and Mork. And then, with no warning at all, Godskull was simply gone. Some say that the Grand Warlord experienced an almighty megavision in which Gork and Mork charged him with a new task. Others say that the Great Green God plucked Godskull up and cast him across the star as a spurred action. Others still claim he was simply struck by inspiration and ambition, or according to official yet absurdly unlikely Imperial propaganda, that he simply turned tail and fled. Whatever the case, Godskull's departure from Armageddon appeared to have come just before Gork's grin split the galaxy, the Cicatrice Maledictum. After it did, strange reports started to reach Imperial sources of the Beast of Armageddon leading planetary invasions in sectors many light years apart. Surely, said those few observers with the ability to piece the reports together, that some accounts had to be mistaken. There was no way that Godskull could be in so many places all at once. In defiance of all logic, however, the attacks continued. No one yet realized was that Godskull had embarked upon his grandest plan to date. He no longer led a walk, but rather the Great Walk. He had set himself not against a single world, nor even a system or a species, but the entire galaxy. And in order to fight and beat every last sentient being that could ever be found amongst the stars, he planned to gather the totality of the orc species to his boss pool, or die trying. Since Godskull began this seemingly impossible endeavor, strange things have been occurring. More orc wogs than ever before are springing up with a disproportionate number traveling towards wherever Godskull is at that current moment. Of course, with the Grand Warlord plunging in and out of Gork's grin like a lunatic, this has still seen many orc tribes rampaging back and forth across the stars in a seemingly random and chaotic fashion. And yet gradually more and more orcs have been rallying to Godskull's side. With each fresh influx, he clobbers whatever big brute warlord seeks to challenge him and folds his followers into his own teeming ranks. Even those who seek to stop his rampage only lend him more power. Every rival he beats down increases his notoriety. When worlds such as Karaheim and Abstentius put up resolute defense against the invading hordes, Godskull only won greater renown when he finally crushed them. Rumor has it that the Eldari of Craftworld Alatok and the savage warriors of the Space Wolves have even taken their turn in striking at the Grand Warlord in the hopes of slaying him and thus breaking his great walk. The latter coming closest to achieving this aim. 
the mighty wolf lord Ragnar Blackmane met Gotskul in battle upon the high world of Krongar, almost leading both combatants' mutual destruction. Yet even as the broken black mane was being borne across the Rubicon Primaris following his crippling injuries after the battle, so was Mad Dog Grotznik recapitating his beloved warlord onto a mighty new super orc body that he had spent many decades perfecting. So it is that God School Thraka is now bigger and more terrifying than ever before, boasting an armored bulk more akin to a Gorkonut than a war boss. God School also wields weaponry to match. Gork's claw is so vast that its blades can enfold a fully armored Primaris Space Marine and slice them neatly into steaming chunks. Mork's roar, his custom shooter, generates so much daka that his victims don't so much die as simply evaporate into a red haze. God's goal is truly a living war engine, a walking embodiment of Gork and Mork and the greatest prophet of the walk. He is coming for the entire galaxy and some are beginning to fear that this is a fight he's going to win. And that concludes our deep dive into the orc lore. I hope you guys enjoyed. Hit the thumbs up button if you guys want a part two. Let me know in the comments section below what you guys want me to talk about next in these deep dive videos. And um, if you guys want to support the channel, you can by hitting us up on Patreon or uh, with a super thanks. Thank you guys so much for listening and we'll talk tomorrow. This is Gersh1 with One Mind Syndicate signing out. <laughs>